You're listening to Life, the Universe, and Everything Else. Today on the show, we're talking about intelligence in non-human animals. Life, the Universe, and Everything Else is a program promoting secular humanism and scientific skepticism produced by the Winnipeg Skeptics. You can email your questions, comments, or criticisms to us at podcast at winnipegskeptics.com. Show notes, references, and relevant links can be found at podcast.wordpress.com or at winnipegskeptics.com slash blog. My name is Jim Newman, and with me today I have Ashlyn Noble. Hello. Laura Creek Newman. Hi there. And special guest, Leslie Saunders. Hello. Leslie is a past host of Life, the Universe, and Everything Else. You last heard her voice on our 100th episode special, and we're delighted to welcome her back again today. <laughs> I feel very special. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're talking about intelligence. The question is often asked dichotomously, is this animal intelligent or not? But intelligence isn't really something that you can either have or not have. It's a spectrum of lots of different abilities, some easily defined, others not so much. So let's start off by talking about what we mean when we say intelligence. When I say intelligence, what does that mean to you? The The ability to (laughs) perform certain tasks well. I was going to say the ability to solve problems. Uh Uh-huh. The ability to learn. Yeah, absolutely. Goal-oriented problem-solving, learning, memory tasks are often associated with intelligence. Um, reasoning, like considering alternative choices and, uh, and making a choice. Uh, how about curiosity? Or maybe awareness of one's surroundings and maybe awareness of oneself even. What about consciousness? Do you think consciousness is necessary for intelligence? I would say so. Well... Oh. But depending on what circumstance. Yeah, are we talking artificial intelligence? Or, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I don't think you have to be, like, there's the theory of mind. Do you have to know you have a mind to be able to use it? I don't think so. Yeah, you can get into questions of metacognition. <laughs> but, but before we do that, let's, uh, let's maybe uh, narrow, narrow our focus a little bit and talk about the field of animal cognition a little bit more in specific. So... The field of animal cognition, sometimes called cognitive ethology, arose from the study of comparative psychology and behavioral ecology. So for the first half of the 20th century, the behaviorist view of animal cognition dominated the field. Are any of you familiar with behaviorism? Yeah, a little bit. Sure. I've heard the term. So essentially, and I'm going to way oversimplify here, but feel free to write me an email anyway. Um, (laughs) Behaviorism is the idea that animal behavior is not controlled by mental processes and that both mental and physical behavior can be explained in large part by environmental or external factors. So we're talking about reflexes, we're talking about instincts, instincts. we're not talking about planning, we're not talking about cognition really. Mm -hmm. Uh, And here we're talking primarily about non-human animals. Although some radical behaviorists also extended this view to humans as well. Listeners will probably be annoyed by how much I am specifying non-human animals instead of just saying animals. That's because I am, you know, one of those silly Darwinists who, you know, sees humans as animals too. The one that actually bothers me a lot more than non-human animals is non-avian dinosaurs. Oh, I love that term. (laughs) Like, when you're talking about dinosaurs, we're talking about the ones that are extinct. Well, but they, like the the modern view of birds is that birds are dinosaurs. Yeah, They're and I part totally get that, and that's super and... awesome. I just, but that's usually not something that you would need to discuss. <laughs> yeah, in and usually people people are using it in the most pedantic, annoying <laughs> way possible. Uh, yeah, and I would never correct somebody when they're talking about dinosaurs, saying, "Oh, I assume you're talking about non-avian dinosaurs. Yeah, I assume I've... you're not talking about you know a sparrow hawk." <laughs> I've totally used that phrase, but in a you know sarcastic jerk. Face manner. (laughs) 
For me, when it comes to this sort of scientific pedantry, I enjoy the specificity, but I never ever want to be like, uh, you know, uh, well, actually, uh, yeah, so I never want to correct somebody with that sort of pedantic, but I enjoy, you know, I say octopodes, I don't say octopuses, and I will never say octopi. But if Dude, somebody says octopi, octopi or octopuses, you know, whatever, man. Live and let live. <laughs> I'm a descriptivist. Anyway, so we had this behaviorist model dominating in the, the first half of the 20th century, but beginning in the 60s, a cognitive revolution took place in research into intelligence, first in humans and then in non-human animals. Uh, it became commonplace for researchers to infer the existence of processes that are not directly observable. We're talking about mind processes. And a Canadian neuropsychologist by the name of Donald Olding Hebb was influential in this shift in thinking in the field. He argued that the mind is simply our name for the processes in the brain that control complex behavior and that it is therefore both possible and necessary to observe behavior and use these behaviors to reason about these hidden mental processes. This may seem like the most obvious thing in the world to us now, but at the time it was considered revolutionary in the field. I find that timeline very interesting too because it was, it was 1960 as well when uh, tool use was finally accepted as a thing in animals, in chimpanzees in particular. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about consciousness for a minute. Consciousness is often seen as an important component in intelligence. Actually, relatively recently, there was an interesting development in the field of animal consciousness research, or rather, an interesting consensus was reached. <laughs> so uh, in 2012, during the Consciousness in Human and Non-Human Animals conference in Cambridge, <laughs> I love that, the, the title of the conference was Consciousness in Human and Non-Human Animals. Great. At this conference, a, a group of scientists made an announcement known as the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness, and they reached Ooh. the following conclusions. Quote, Convergent evidence indicates that non-human animals have the neuroanatomical, neurochemical, and neurophysiological substrates of conscious states, along with the capacity to exhibit intentional behaviors. Consequently, the weight of evidence indicates that humans are not unique in possessing the neurological substrates that generate consciousness. Non-human animals, including all mammals and birds and many other creatures, including octopuses, also possess these neurological substrates, end quote. So basically what they're saying is that we have evidence that not only do these non-human animals possess the necessary physical and biochemical uh, factors required for consciousness, but they're also exhibiting behaviors indicative of consciousness. So we can conclude from that that they are probably conscious in a similar way to the way people are conscious. And v very contrary to the ideas of the behaviorists of the early part of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Where everything is just a machine that happens to have right. squishy parts. And of course, like I feel the need to mention that as a determinist, I do feel that we are essentially very complex biochemical machines. But that doesn't <laughs> mean that we're not conscious. And it doesn't mean that we don't make choices. I just don't believe in, you know, contra-causal free will. <laughs> These choices are complex, and there's all sorts of mental and environmental factors that go into decisions. The, the idea that an animal is conscious isn't contrary to the idea that these processes are, are physical in the brain. So it's common to imagine nature as a ladder in which different species occupy successively higher rungs with, you know, us humans at the top. But anyone who understands evolutionary biology is going to see problems with this model immediately, right? Cognitive ethologists suggest that it's better to recognize that different animals may have different types of cognitive processes, which may be understood in terms of their cognitive adaptations to their respective ecological niches. You know, you may not need to develop tool use in a specific environment. You may not need to develop certain types of problem-solving abilities if you're a peak predator. 
We shouldn't assume that different animal species are intelligent in the same way that humans are. Their cognitive processes may be more or less similar to our own, and unsurprisingly our closest biological relatives, the great apes, tend to do best when their intelligence is assessed in the way that we might assess human intelligence, while more distant relatives tend to do less well when we assess them on kind of a human scale. So one of the main risks that researchers face when interpreting animal behavior and attempting to assess intelligence is anthropomorphism. I know, Leslie, you're going to talk about this a little bit. So that's the tendency to interpret an animal's behavior in terms of human feelings, thoughts, and motivations. And the last thing I want to talk about before we talk about intelligence in specific animals, I just want to expand a little bit on this idea of different types of intelligence. So. When we talk about artificial intelligence, for example, um, as opposed to intelligence that's a product of evolution, uh, we could conceive of an intelligent, self-aware thinking being that doesn't have a will uh, or a drive, that doesn't want to do anything. G general artificial intelligence is often seen, and you've probably heard in the news, you know, how um, Elon Musk is, you know, terrified that machines are going to kill us, and so he's got this is pouring all of this money into researching to, you know, prevent malevolent AI. So general artificial intelligence is seen as incredibly dangerous because of concerns that any super intelligence that we might create would be both highly competent and also potentially malevolent, or at <laughs> least, you know, totally indifferent to human concerns. But this is perhaps a failure of imagination on our part, where we assume that a human-like intelligence is the only relevant form of intelligence, and any AI that we create would be human-like. It would have a drive to do something. It would try to consume resources and execute a plan, and maybe humans would have to be, you know, cut out of the equation. We often think of will and determination to strive, to seek, to find, and not to <laughs> yield, to quote Tennyson. Uh, as integral parts of intelligence. Hey, Ulysses is a fucking great poem, okay? <laughs> but should we consider an otherwise intelligent being that lacks will or drive any less intelligent? Or terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, I'm not so much afraid of the evil robots as much as I am as the completely indifferent <laughs> robots. Like, the Borg isn't right. evil because they, they, they're <laughs> indifferent to everybody. <laughs> But I think, uh, I think the, the point is that they might have, you know, any AI that we create might not want to do anything, right? It might not have a drive to assimilate. It might not have, whether it's indifferent to humans, it might be indifferent to humans because it's indifferent to everything. It, ha it has no desire, right? But that's what I find scarier. <laughs> but it's not going to do anything, right? It, it, it has no reason to do anything. It has no... But I don't, I don't really think there are or there can be animals that have no drive because they're... I agree. Okay. <laughs> and with robots, so this... if, if a robot's going to do something, then how can it not do something else as a side effect? It's like, it's like with uh, herbal medicine. If it has an effect, it has a side effect, right? <laughs> right. No, I, I agree with you. Th this discussion of AI is just an exercise in explaining how you could hypothetically get something that is highly intelligent that would also be not human-like in its intelligence. So you can have something that understands and that can think and that can know lots of things and that can learn without also having an internal drive to accomplish goals. Okay. Uh, and I agree, Ashlyn, that uh, any evolved intelligence would have to have a will or a drive. Uh, at least an instinctive one, at because least to reproduce. because <laughs> if it didn't, then it w then it would no longer exist, yeah. right? Yeah. Whereas one that we create intentionally, if we don't add that in, there's no reason to to think that sure. it would acquire. Yeah. But that, we're talking right? about animals, right? That's in the title. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. As I said, this is just just an Back exercise around. in in explaining that there I, can I, be I different types of intelligences. So when we consider the intelligence of non-human animals, we should also consider the fact that their intelligence might not be exactly like ours. But that doesn't mean that it's irrelevant or somehow lesser. So as we talk about intelligence in various animals, we're going to talk about some of the measures that we use to try to ascertain different types of intelligence. These can include tool use, memorization, such as, you know, labyrinths, uh, and can also include an interesting technique known as the mirror test, which I think Leslie is going to touch on in a little bit. 
One of the biggest challenges that we have with animal research is that there isn't enough of it being done. We're just starting to figure out the questions to ask. So when you talk about animal research, you're not talking, you're talking about research into animal behavior and r- rather than like using animals that's... as a proxy for humans for like animal testing oh, or something yeah, like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. But uh, there are some things that are really easy to test for. For example, a goat that gets knocked up by a sheep, you could pretty easily tell if the animal born has the goat for a mother or sheep for, for a father. Okay. Now, is, the, is there a name for the offspring of that no, animal? No, uh, a geep is... Okay, yeah. When... <laughs> I love those, like, uh, like well, the ligers geep, the, and... Yeah, the yeah. geep is when the father is a sheep and the mother's shoat. the goat. The shoat. It usually happens this way. I happen to have an uncle who has had two of these crosses, <laughs> and apparently there's only been, like, five documented cases of this happening ever in the world. Really? Wow. wow. But really, how common could it be? Like, if my uncle had two of them. Yeah. They're probably just not documented that often because the farmer's just like, eh, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> well, how many times uh, are sheep and goats with the modern farming system that we have kept in the same Right. Pen? Like that it would be allowed to have. Never right? mind, let allowed in the same house. Yeah. As in right. at my uncle Bill's place. <laughs> If a sheep knocks up a goat and there isn't a researcher around to document it, did it actually happen? Yeah. <laughs> That's the big question. Right. Um, lesbian cows, a lot harder to confirm. <laughs> Very valuable. Uh, do you guys know what a gomer bull is? No. Lesbian cows and gomer bulls are used for the same purposes. Uh, gomer bull has been either uh, not castrated, given a vasectomy, or their penis has been surgically altered. So they can try to have sex, but... They There's can't no insertion. Really. Right. And uh, they're very valuable. They'll protect their cows. And, right. and a lesbian cow isn't just a cow that'll mount another cow. Because cows will mount anything. <laughs> my, my cows will mount bulls and a dog and a tractor. That's. But a they'll. Dog, ch- that sounds dangerous. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Like a dog. <laughs> yeah. But uh, they'll look after their cows like a bull would look after a cow. Oh, okay. They'll stop other bulls from trying to impregnate their cows and they can also detect when other cows are in heat like a a male cow can like a bull cow can so these things are very very valuable no research done on them you know you you can't tell by doing a test a person who's a lesbian how are you going to find that out in an animal until you just kind of happen to observe it one day right find one exactly so how much of this research can we expect to find yeah Oh, fair enough. And we're still really in our infancy of doing animal research. And when you're looking at most animal studies, most everything's been done within the last 50 years. And that's for all animals. That's domestic. That's wild. That's in every part of the world. And scientists had a lot of misconceptions to overcome with this, too. It used to be common knowledge that bees were busy and grasshoppers were lazy. (laughs) Now we know that bees spend most of their days just kind of waiting around for something to happen, and grasshoppers (laughs) are pretty much working nonstop. Now that's nothing to do with animal intelligence, but all of this research has only been done in like within the last hundred years, and... And unfortunately, some of the most visible scientists in the field of animal research have a lot of woo attached to them. Oh, yeah. oh really? Yeah. I uh, <laughs> was listening to this one scientist on Quirks and Quirks, and he seemed really reasonable. He was talking about dolphin intelligence. And, John Lilly? Because I think I read about him. <laughs> <laughs> Everything he said seemed really reasonable on the podcast. And then when you're listening to what he was saying with Miley Cyrus, it was all about how dolphins are psychic and it's all yeah. about how to explain it. And... If it is the same guy, his his research definitely started reasonable. And then he hit a point where he started injecting dolphins with LSD and his funding <laughs> dried up at that point. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, my summary, I guess, is that we still need to do a lot more vigorous, rigorous testing to show that certain animal behavior can't be explained by lower intelligence. And even before that, we need to really define what intelligence is. Uh, many important questions are impossible to answer with our current level of understanding. And that's not to say that studying animals is useless or we can't get there. It's just that we aren't there yet. Right. And we're making progress. Like we're learning new things all the time. And every time I open a paper, I see a report about certain animals doing things that we previously thought they were incapable of. Mm-hmm. 
I think maybe we need to give animals more credit and just people more time and resources to find what they are truly capable of. Yeah, absolutely. It, well, it seems like it's only in the last half century that we've realized that there is value in just knowing what animals do as opposed to what they can do for us, which mm-hmm. is what we have mm-hmm. been looking at previously, right? Either as a way to learn about anatomy or to test medications or whatever else it is or work or like agriculture or something, but just learning about animals to see what animals are like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and uh, as you were as you were mentioning, a lot of what we know about animals is kind of um, common sense. It's passed down, you know, like farm. And some of that like, common sense is dead wrong. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> of course. But like, there are lots of things that you know every farmer knows about the behavior of this animal or that animal, and a lot of it will be right. Maybe a lot of it will be wrong. A lot of it will be, you know, incomplete. Because, you know, it's all passed through culture and none of it is rigorous scientific research. Mm -hmm. It's just what people have experienced, right? And plural of anecdote is not data. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're going to go into some specifics. The first group of animals that we're going to talk about are primates. And primates are some of the most fascinating animals when it comes to discussing intelligence. Anthropologists have observed members of this order engaging in tool use, complex burial rites, agriculture, religious observance, industrial activity, and even podcasting. (laughs) Or are we going to be focusing mostly on non-human primates? Yes. (laughs) All right. Well, Ashlyn, why don't you tell us a little bit about intelligence in primates? Non-human animals, non-human primates. Uh, So primate cognition is a huge field of study. Uh, It'll just be a quick overview. Uh, I've taken a couple of anthropology and a primatology course, uh, but even then we only skimmed the surface. Uh, So I'm going to focus on two areas, language use and tool use, um, mostly because these are both things that were once considered the thing that makes us different from animals. You know, we Hmm. were the tool using people and we were, well, the only ones who have language anyway. So that was what made us different and important. Yeah. Homo habilis. Mm Mm-hmm. Handyman. Handyman, yeah. yeah. Hmm. So Homo habilis was so called because uh, of the hypothesized tool use. Yeah. So first of all, we're going to start out with language use. Uh, Language use by primates is actually the subject of quite a bit of controversy. Uh, Several great apes have been taught many ASL signs, uh, including one called Noam Chimpsky. And uh, the most famous (laughs) is probably Coco. Yeah. Apes also have been taught to use keyboards because they have the the finger dexterity in order to do that. Uh, they don't have the ability, uh, their vocal cords don't close entirely, and they also don't have the ability to move their jaws and tongues the same way that we do. So actual words and speaking is pretty much impossible for them the way that we do. But these are ways that we can sort of approximate that kind of thing. So they can use words that they've learned to communicate different ideas. So like they can use the sign for flower. Uh, If they don't know the sign for smell, um, they can sort of interchange things in order to get their ideas across. And they can also combine signs to make new phrases. One of them was observed using the signs for open food drink when they wanted to open the fridge. (laughs) <laughs> okay, because food and drink are both food in the fridge. Food and drink are in right. the fridge, so open it up, there's the food and drink. <laughs> My daughter does the same thing sometimes. <laughs> and it's uh, been observed the same way in uh, like gorillas and toddlers. Uh, when they're taught sign language, they start to babble with their hands uh, instead of with their mouths. So they will start to make up signs that they think sort of approximate the thing that they want. And so this will be the way that they acquire new language. Oh, interesting. Uh, In the wild, gorillas have been observed using at least 66 different signs and body language gestures with specific meaning to communicate. Uh, So sign language might be a fairly natural way for them to transmit information. These are gorillas that have never uh, interacted with humans in any meaningful way. This is just their natural way of communicating. Mm. They have signs and body language that mean specific things. Uh, On the other hand, Uh, There are a few things that primates have not been able to demonstrate. So even the apes with the highest mastery of sign language, they don't follow any grammar or other language rules that we would expect to see if it was a real language and not just symbol use. Uh, Right. So they can pick out the right symbols to mean the things that they want, but they don't really put them together into sentences. They don't follow... There's no syntax. Right. There's no syntax. There's no... It's only semantics. (laughs) they don't even toddlers when they're learning language they learn 
there there are certain rules. There are things like singular and plural, and and what order things go in the syntax, and uh, verb tenses, things like that. Those are things that primates don't seem to be able to grasp at all. It really is just a, a use of symbols, and so most scholars will agree that there's something lacking in between the word acquisition and true language use. And it's really just symbol use and not a real language. Okay. There's like a, a step that's missing in between right. there for hmm. them to get to where we are, where we la- use language. Um, so, so does that mean that they're essentially incapable of any communication beyond like what they want? Uh, well, that's interesting because they can communicate things other than what they want. But uh, the next part of it is that the only thing that they really can't communicate even with this symbol use, is they've never been observed asking questions. Hmm. Right. So they can be trained to answer very complex questions, including things like who, what, where questions, uh, which are really hard um, when you go through all the steps that you need to answer something like that. Uh, In one example, a bonobo who was named Kanzi was asked, can you make the dog bite the snake? And this was a phrase that, to the researcher's knowledge, he had never heard before, and he would have no reason to understand, but he knew all of those words. And he searched among his toys until he found a dog, and he found a snake, and he acted out the dog biting the snake. Hmm. So, I mean, that's a really complicated question, and he needed several steps of thought in order to make that happen. I'm not sure, like, you could interpret that rather than a question as a directive, right? Sure. Make the dog bite the snake. Yeah. Okay. But that's still, like, you have to go and find the stuff. Yeah. 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 You can can put complex ideas together. Yeah. But, like I said, they don't ask questions themselves. Uh, And a lot of the time you hear, like, a gorilla with a lot of sign language will have the cognitive ability of, like, a two- or a three-year-old. And as everyone else in the room except me knows, (laughs) uh, toddlers ask a lot of questions. Constantly. (laughs) The same one repeatedly. Why? 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 Why Why this? What's that? Is she a girl? (laughs) Yes, Kira, she's a girl. Crying out loud. Gender is clearly the most important thing about whatever that is. (laughs) Obviously. In this case, it was less. Fair enough. Yeah. So I I assume that Curious George probably isn't that curious. No. (laughs) Well, maybe he is. He he heard what happens to the cat. Curious in action, but not in communication. Yeah. And so you can obviously, you can observe monkeys and apes being curious they explore their environment and they check things out and they figure out what things are but um i think one of the articles put it when a trainer is done a session asking a gorilla a hundred questions and goes to leave the gorilla never stops them being like so where are you going why are you leaving <laughs> right <laughs> there there's no none of the curiosity about the trainer or the environment uh and there was a an experiment proposed um, by the trainer of a uh, an ape called Sarah, where they said, you know, maybe I could envision a scenario in which I could make her ask a question, like if I always gave her the same food at the same time every single day, and then one day that food wasn't there, would she then be like, hey, where's my food? Um, but for some reason, they never did that. <laughs> they were like, oh, like a good experiment. I know. Yeah. <laughs> And they were like, ah, you know, that's just not in our training protocol. But I mean, they must have done it with other apes at some point. And apparently they've just never been seen to ask questions. And so at this point, some researchers now say, well, this is the thing. This is the defining characteristic that differentiates human and primate (laughs) cognition. Humanity (laughs) of the gaps. Yes. (laughs) You know, we ask questions. Primates do not ask questions. Um, but I mean, we've been wrong about that so many times. Well, and the goalpost keeps on moving. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that yeah too, it's ridiculous. Right. Yeah, um, and it's actually interesting. Um, Alex the parrot, a very famous example of a smart animal, actually has been uh, was observed to ask questions, uh, including uh, he wanted to know what color he was, which I think is adorable. <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, because he was able to pick out the colors of other objects. They could point to things at what color is this, Alex? And he would tell them. And at one point he was like, so what color am I? <laughs> and it took him, I think, six tries to learn gray. I am gray. <laughs> Oh, it's adorable. That's so cute. <laughs> no, it actually reminds me of Kira. She constantly wants to have a pink nose. And so when we're outside in the cold, mm -hmm. she'll she'll look at one of us and say, do you have a pink nose? And we'll say, well, probably. It's pretty cold. She'll say, do I have a pink nose? <laughs> yes, Kira, you have a pink nose. Mirrors, great things. <laughs> So the other part that I wanted to touch on was tool use. Mm -hmm. For a long time, at the beginning of humans formally studying primates, uh, humans were really dumb and unobservant and couldn't figure <laughs> out that primates were using tools. Mm -hmm. And so, again, this was the thing that differentiated humans and primates was we were tool users and they were not. Uh, now that we're a little bit more aware, we've seen hundreds of ways that primates and other animals use tools for pretty much everything. Uh, they use sticks to get termites out of their homes. Uh, they use sharpened branches for hunting, uh, small bits of rock or twigs to help them groom themselves, like cleaning out their ears or under their nails. And uh, the use of tools from the environment is something that's fairly common in the animal kingdom. You can see um, octopoides. Octopodes. <laughs> octopodes. Or just, just say octopodes. Say whatever you want. <laughs> It's, um, that, that would be the Greek pluralization. Yes. Uh, you can see them carrying around like big clamshells to hide in, stuff oh, like yeah. that. Oh, yeah. That's great. So using tools from their environment is pretty common in the animal kingdom, but more uncommon is the actual manufacturing of tools. Things like sharpening sticks is, is right. pretty uncommon. Uh, and so we can see that happening very often in different troops for hunting. And so that's very interesting to researchers. Um, and we can also observe that all of the ape species uh, very clearly understand that there are causal relationships by watching them use tools to navigate food around obstacles. Um, so that's something else that's fairly rare that, you know, if I do this, it causes this other thing. Hmm. Um, and they can use tools uh, not just for practical concerns, but for comfort as well. There was an article just a few days ago uh, where an orangutan was observed using a blanket to make himself a hammock in the enclosure at a zoo in Thailand. Oh, that's amazing. That's awesome. <laughs> as far as I could figure out, he had never had a hammock before. I just decided, there, I have a blanket, I have a corner. <laughs> but, it, like, even if you had had a hammock, and, like, you do, if you'd seen a hammock, you made one. Like, that's yeah. still, that's still oh, pretty yeah, good. Oh, yeah, remember the thing, and you said, I have things that could be that thing. Mm -hmm. I will make that thing. That's yeah. pretty the advanced. It's the MacGyver of orangutans. <laughs> Yeah, so they can do some pretty awesome things with tools. The other really cool thing about primates is that uh, the use of tools is learned and it's passed on between groups of primates. Um, and so this can be thought of as culture, which is another word that for a long time was reserved for use in association only with humans. But it really is a tool culture when primates are teaching each other to use tools and you can sort of see when one group figures out a new tool, you can watch it in a sort of epidemiological fashion move from one group to another across an area, right. which Memes. is really cool. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so as, as Jem sort of touched upon, there's so much more to primate cognition. They have like super complex social structures. They have impressive problem solving abilities. Their emotional development and regulation is remarkably similar to that of toddlers. <laughs> um, so barely existent. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they learn to regulate their emotions in the same way. And as they, as they grow up, they, they figure it out. They, researchers have, have looked into it and it's, like their brain processes are, are so similar it's really hmm. awesome interesting but so I, I tend to believe now that if there's something that we say primates just aren't capable of x or they don't have the capacity for y we will eventually be proven wrong <laughs> <laughs> so here's uh i guess kind of an ethical question should a non-human primate be considered a person or is it just a toaster <laughs> it's, a, uh, it's a reference to the measure of a man because that's Sec not a false dichotomy at all yeah <laughs> yes. second season episode of star trek the next generation there are more Pretty options great. than that i think and, <laughs> and i mean yeah you have to how you define person matters right <laughs> you know should we be enclosing them in teeny tiny cages all by themselves probably not that's a terrible thing to do 
There's wow. actually there's a suit ongoing in mm-hmm. the United States uh, on behalf of primates that are in a zoo, mm-hmm. uh, and the the suit alleges that they have the right of habeas corpus and that they should be not incarcerated mm-hmm. and moved to, to a sanctuary. And uh, the the I believe it's on appeal right now. It failed initially. Mm-hmm. Um, but they, I just find that a very interesting question, and I am definitely in the camp of uh, we should respect their right to mm-hmm. self determination, essentially. Yeah, but there's you know there's a line between we shouldn't keep them in tiny cages and we should let them vote. You know? Sure, right, right. <laughs> yeah, they might vote for Trump. <laughs> a lot of them are out here. <laughs> Can I say that out loud? <laughs> Next, uh, Laura is going to tell us. All about cetaceans. Dolphins and whales and... Porpoises. On the planet Earth, man had always assumed that he was more intelligent than dolphins because he's achieved so much. The wheel, New York, wars and so on. Whilst all the dolphins had ever done was muck about in the water having a good time. But conversely, the dolphins believed that they were more intelligent than man for precisely the same reasons. So... As Jim mentioned, cetaceans are the large water mammals that many of us love and are often kept in captivity for our enjoyment, unfortunately. Are they as magical as I want them to be? Well, probably not. I heard a rumor that they might be psychic. Uh, no. No. They also probably won't actually assist you in giving birth. That was my next question. Don't do that. Um, they probably won't cure any of your diseases. So unless you your disease is for sure cured by seeing amazing creatures, because then, yeah, they would cure that. Totally. So, yeah, if you need to see something uplifting, go see them. Maybe that will help you. But they don't even have that magical shark cartilage that will cure your cancer? No. Note to listeners, shark cartilage, not cure cancer. <laughs> no. No. So, no, they're probably not magical. You know, as some people like to point out, there's... Pretty much, if there's a claim for something, dolphins have probably also been listed as a potential cure, or as a potential <laughs> something or other. They, yeah, they have this, uh, this I don't know, reputation for being magical. And no, they're, they're probably not. There are, there are other animals out there, but they are pretty cool animals. I mean, think about their history. They were land mammals that moved into the water. So they had four legs and walked on land. And over millions of years became really efficient predator creatures in the sea that still breathe air. Isn't that incredible? (laughs) And they merged their two back legs back into it, like into a fin. And like, it's incredible what these things have done. You're like, walking is hard. I'm going to go back into the water. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Ambulocetus also looks freaking amazingly cool. It looks kind of like a warg. I don't know what that is. A war, uh, the giant like beast wolves from Lord of the Rings. Oh, okay. Yeah, Ambulocetus is a pretty cool looking. Yes. <laughs> did Did I ever tell you guys on the podcast at least about going to the Rock and Mineral show? No, I don't think so. I don't remember. <laughs> it was awesome because apparently the Rock and Mineral show in Winnipeg is also the Wu Central Market. Well, because they have crystals. Yes. And crystals cure everything. <laughs> but they actually had like a separate part of the show that was for all of the totally bananas people to sell their crap. Oh, really? And so we, Dave and I decided to go because we wanted to look for some lapidary equipment. And we ended up looking at all the other tables and there was one person selling a light that was supposed to like cleanse your cells. And, and once I got past her, there was a table full of beautiful little pendants and I picked one up that had a dolphin on it and I was like, oh, this is pretty. And the woman came up to me and said, it's been imbued with 100% pure dolphin energy. <laughs> And I couldn't uh, keep a straight face at that point because I'd just been talking to the light lady. None of that knockoff <laughs> tuna energy for this stone. And so I just said, oh, great. And I put it down and walked away. <laughs> what a test for that to make sure they're not getting ripped off. Yeah. Yeah. It's went, been adulterated. <laughs> I went to the website after and apparently dolphin energy... Um, is it's just an energy drink. <laughs> is acquired by saying a blessing and having the dolphin spirit come down and 
and shoot the dolphin energy rays into the beautiful crystal, which is then etched or something. But they have so many other products as well. They had ones, uh, they had an elf scarf that was full of magical elf energy. I feel, I feel like I've heard some of this before. <laughs> so yeah. Oh, Lord. And Th- that reminds me of the, like, the homeopathic remedies that have, like, the homeopathic remedy is Venus. But it's actually just like they pointed a telescope at Venus. Not actually, <laughs> you know, a piece of Venus that's diluted, right? Yeah. And the, the dolphin pendant was supposed to specifically have, like, very calm energy that was going to help you, um, attract, you know, the spirits of happy animals to accompany you throughout your day. And so Dave and I just looked at each other and, like, dolphins are calm? Well, that's what I'm thinking. It's like, really? <laughs> Anyway, sorry, Laura. No, that's okay. So this, yeah, this is the kind of thing that a lot of people seem to think about dolphins. Probably not true. (laughs) Not too long ago, though, it was seen that dolphins, like a lot of other animals, just like non-human primates, oh, they're not intelligent at all. They're fish eaters, right? They're just another fish in the sea. You know, okay, we know they're not a fish, but they just eat fish, right? That's all they do. I hear fish are good for your brain, though, so they're probably (laughs) pretty smart. Right. Right. A lot of fish oil. So, <laughs> again, like in the last half century or so that we've actually started looking at them and challenging this this thought, how, are they actually intelligent? Now, there are many different species of cetaceans. I believe there's 86 different species between oh, wow. all the dolphins because there's a lot of species of dolphin. That's I never true. realized this, but there was a lot. Um, dolphins are also often compared to humans because they appear pretty much everywhere across the globe. Like, if there is a place that is relatively habitable, there are dolphins there. And mostly Compared- underwater. Well, mostly underwater. <laughs> you don't see mostly. so many land dolphins. <laughs> yeah. um, but, like, yeah, if there is habitable water, there's probably some dolphins there. And they're also compared to humans because wherever we've found ourselves, we've found something to eat and we've adapted our diets and dolphins tend to do that quite a lot as well. So their diets vary greatly. So anyway, there are many, many species of dolphins, um, a lot of whales, and then again, there's porpoises and narwhals and things like that as well. So some of the best studied ones, dolphins get a lot of the attention, um, as well as orcas or killer whales. Um, and then some of the other large whales that we have more contact with, like humpbacks and sperm whales, we, we do more study. Not a lot of, not all of the species though do get a lot of study, either just because it hasn't been done or it's hard to come in contact. Like, I mean, how many blue whales do we really see? (laughs) Probably not all that many, right? Mm -hmm. So it would be really hard to do any research on it. So some of the, the things that I'm going to reference, a lot of it actually has to do with dolphins because we're so enamored of them and We've kept them in captivity for a long time, and we've actually, we've learned a lot about them because of that. It's really unfortunate, and as you read through the research, you can see that the researchers are really, um, they're torn about this, because they love learning about these creatures, but they know that it's not good for them to keep them there. So, anyway, so I am going to talk about dolphins a lot, but a lot of this extends to other creatures. So... Some of the things that we've learned about dolphins um, and that we've learned about their intelligence is that they do actually exhibit a lot of things that, as we previously mentioned, would be part of what we would consider intelligence. So things like learning and cognition and that. So I wanted to start with talking about brain size and development. So one of the things that we've always talked about that differentiates humans from other animals or what makes us special is our big brains, right? That's that's what we have compared to other things. We don't have the brawn. We don't have the speed or anything. We've got the brains, right? And we've got these really highly wrinkled brains that give us all this cognitive ability. And it is true that humans do have fairly large brains, especially the body to brain ratio. The average human brain weighs about 1,300 to 1,400 grams. So like a little over, somewhere around three Three pounds or so. Whereas the the biggest brain on the planet belongs to the sperm whale at 8,000 grams. So that is... Uh, bigger, uh, almost 20 pounds <laughs> there, that brain. But also think of the size of that whale, yeah. <laughs> right? It's pretty small compared so, to how big that absolutely. is. Absolutely. The brain to body ratio is really important to take into context here. So when you look at that, humans do have the biggest brain to body ratio, I believe, for most of the research I could find. Yeah. But most cetaceans, particularly dolphins, are second to humans in that. So Com- even compared to our, our primate relatives that are far more closely related to us than dolphins are, their brains are much, their brains are much larger and have, um, not only are they 
do they have that big brain to body ratio, but they have a lot of the cortical folds, more so even than humans do. Cortical and, folds are relevant because that increased surface area. Right. Yeah. So it increases the surface area and that appears to be what gives us that higher functioning. So the more surface area, the more neurons, and then the more higher functioning we're able to have with it. So with, if you look at creatures that we would say are more primitive, you'll see their brains are not as complex. They're, they're much smoother. They don't have those same kind of folds. And some of them don't even have the neocortex, that outer layer at all. So they don't have the cells that we would say are the, the reason for that functioning. We should include in the show notes that uh, graph of body size versus brain size. And you can see the the outliers on the line, which are pretty cool to look at. Yeah, yeah, and absolutely. And while it's important to know that the cetaceans have very similarly structured brains in that sense to humans, it doesn't mean that necessarily a large brain makes you smart, for example, because things like elephants, for example, also have very large brains, Mm -hmm. but they have much lower functioning in many ways than other creatures do. Or there's some creatures like the echidna apparently has a highly um, crinkled brain with lots and lots of folds, but they're not considered very intelligent in many tests at all, like much, much less so than many other creatures. So just having those features does not make an animal intelligent or not. That's interesting. I wonder, like we were talking before, maybe we need to develop a new test for echidnas to find their kind of intelligence. So maybe there is, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe it's just hidden. We haven't asked the right questions, so how can we get the answers? I think it's also just important to know that intelligence isn't determined by a particular brain structure. Yeah, it's not a straight line. It's not a straight line, right? You can't just say, well, build a bigger brain with more folds and thus, (laughs) you know, Einstein, right? Like, you, you can't do that. All I know about echidnas is that they have, like, pointy knuckles. And <laughs> yeah. They, and they don't like hedgehogs. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, cetacean brains are structured differently than human brains are, and that would make sense. As I mean, you would expect. Our, our common ancestors <laughs> diverged something like 95 million years ago or something <laughs> like that. So they don't look quite the same. However... When you look at that, um, the neocortex, that outer layer that's responsible for cognition, similar parts of it are mapped on both human brains and cetacean brains. So you can see the same parts light up with different things. So that's a really interesting thing that they're, even though they're so divergent, they they have those same portions. Um, And they still have the same types of lobes. However, cetaceans actually have an additional lobe in their brain that humans and other creatures don't have. It's called the paralimbic lobe. Now, every higher creature has a limbic system and a limbic lobe, and that's apparently where the emotions are processed. And so it's thought that the cetaceans have this paralimbic lobe, and that gives them actually a higher ability or or more... um, developed sense of processing emotions and dealing with this. And they think that that has something to do with the very um, complex social networks that they live in. And so they they use that part of their brain to help maintain all of that and keep the memory and the connections and mm-hmm. that. So that's actually interesting that they have an additional part of the brain that, that we don't so even cool. have. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And dolphins in particular actually exhibit more voluntary functions than humans do. So dolphins, I had no idea, they're voluntary breathers, even when they're asleep. Oh, wow. They're completely voluntary breathers. That would come in handy if you live underwater. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So, but the other thing is that, you know, that's also tricky because your brain can never really shut off, right? Because you'll die. So what they see is that dolphins can sleep one half of their brain at a time. Yeah, that's what I heard. So they can switch off. (laughs) So you can still breathe and do the bare minimum stuff, but you rest your brain and then you switch off. So you get fully rested, but you live. (laughs) That's incredible. Like, I mean, super cool. Having to think about breathing all the time would be exhausting. Well, exactly. So, so that mean, well, one half of the brain is asleep. They could hypothetically only like move half of their body until they wake up. So I, I don't know. I didn't look into this too much further, but it does sound like their functions can be divided along hemispheric lines. So like each eye is controlled hemispherically, right. for example, for them. Um, so I would imagine that there's other things that... They can only do a bit of. I really don't know the yeah. answers to this. So if you're interested, please go look it up. <laughs> or if you know the answer, let us know. That would be cool. <laughs> so like you said, Ashlyn, like, think about if we had to think about breathing all day long. How much less would we get accomplished in the day? <laughs> like so much less. That's why they haven't got around to like cities and wars and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, shit, I almost forgot to breathe. <laughs> 
So, yes, their brains are structured differently, but they're also structured very similarly to ours. And they have the same parts as ours do and that a lot of um, higher mammals do. And so that's pretty incredible, I think. So just in terms of the way their brain works, I think there's a lot of potential for intelligence and that there. Communication is another one. For as long as people have loved dolphins and have been looking for them to cure whatever magical <laughs> illness that they have, they, we've also been looking for a way to communicate with dolphins, right? We've been looking for a dolphin language just to, to commune with the dolphins, right? It's harder to teach them sign language and how to use <laughs> Yes, <laughs> yes. Their flippers don't work so well on those kinds of things. As a kid, aside from communicating, and I think maybe I've mentioned this before, aside from communicating <laughs> with aliens... Uh, that was what I really wanted. The idea of being able to like make friends with a creature that's so different and has such a different experience, but to be able to share common communication, that just seems like such a magical idea. <laughs> so to date, we haven't been able to find a dolphin language. And it's been said that it's either going to be one of the sort of greatest black holes that there's just no answer, we'll never find it, or it's going to be one of the greatest discoveries mm -hmm. that we find because it's so, so difficult. Like, and there's lots, there's researchers that are, are working on this constantly. Like, but, we haven't discovered their language or we haven't discovered how to communicate with them? Well, we're not sure if they have a language yet. Really? Like we don't really yeah. know, we know that they're communicating with each Absolutely. other. Absolutely. We just don't know so, how. like the primates. Psychically. Yes. <laughs> Psychically. <laughs> I'm going to get to that. It's kind of true. <laughs> um, sort of like the primates, they're communicating. They mm -hmm. obviously are. And they're communicating in ways that are probably more complex than that. You know, there's been um, reports of researchers where they have this pair of dolphins that are trained to do some tricks, but they've also been trained to understand the sign of do a new trick, something I haven't seen. Nice. And this pair of dolphins will go under the water, click and squawk and whatever, and come up and do something in tandem mm -hmm. that they've never been taught oh, before. Wow. And they will do it again, something new after that. And they like you, they record them and they're talking and like so, they're, yeah, they're, they're obviously they're, they are communicating. And Communicating something kind of complex. Absolute, too. Absolutely, right? Because, I mean, two creatures to come up with the same idea and to do that, that's pretty yeah. impressive. So, um, like, they do, they absolutely communicate, probably in a fairly complex way. One of the challenges, though, is that they have more ways of communicating than we do. Not only do they make sounds, they make clicks and then they make sort of squeal sounds, classic uh, dolphin kind of sounds. But they also echolocate, mm -hmm. right? And they use that for communication as well. Not only that, but their hearing range because of the echolocation is incredibly huge compared to humans. And it's only been in the recent past, like the last 10 years or so, that we've even had equipment that can record their sounds. So part of our problem is that we just can't hear. Like, we, we can't comprehend what they're doing. It's so big that we can't put it together. So of course we can't find a language if we're only hearing. If we were only hearing the ands and the thes and the yous, we'd never have any idea what you're talking about, right? So we're hoping as time goes on and equipment keeps getting better that we can actually record this. And now that we have a lot of computer algorithms um, to help track patterns and things like that, to help learn to see if there is a bit of a language. Or well, crack there. the code. Yeah, so to crack Or maybe that's, you know, a, a human hubris there. That... Yeah, so, I mean, it might turn out that there isn't truly a language the way that we think of it. Like, they're communicating ideas, but they're not using a syntax or anything like that. Or yeah. maybe not, you know, there's, there's potential. We really can't say one way or the other because we're just scratching the surface mm -hmm. of what they're even doing. So dolphins in particular, um, they have this huge ability to communicate. Like I said, not just sound, but the echolocation. And their echolocation, the way that they process that is different than the way that some other animals process it and that than the way that we would process sound in that as well. When we compare it to humans, you know, our primary um, intake for information is visual and our primary output is auditory. Mm -hmm. For them, though, their primary information is auditory in both senses and then the, the echolocation as well. So they don't have that translation of information. You don't have to, because in our brains, when we see a picture, you know, we have to translate that into something that we turn into words to get mm -hmm. the idea out. But for them, they get the sound in and the sound can come back out. So it's just translated differently. The other thing, too, is that with their echolocation, they can get a mental image of the thing that they're looking at. 
so they can sort of see. So they're not, okay, they're doing their echolocation. They're not like, oh, there's an obstacle up here. They're saying, oh, there's a coral reef with a fish right there. Like, it's, <laughs> it's very complex, apparently, what they can see. The other cool thing is that they can, I don't know how this works exactly, but they can translate that echolocation, that image, to another dolphin. So the dolphin will see what they saw. That is messed up. So it's kind of like psychic. <laughs> like they will they will do their echolocation clips and the dolphin will just see the fish. The other dolphin that didn't actually see the fish will see the fish that the first dolphin saw. So which like, is incredible. <laughs> it would be like it was described as like a hologram. Yeah. If we could just be like hologram to Leslie and Leslie's like, oh, I totally see that thing over there. What it reminds me of is you you have your spatial information. So you, you have the idea of where everything is and what its shape is. You encode that and you transmit it through a series of clicks, just like digital information. Yeah. And yeah, then it gets, it gets decoded on yeah. the other side. That's exactly how they described it. Humans are analog, dolphins are digital. That's super that's cool. And that's how they totally describe it. So I think that's so cool. The other thing that's cool too is with the echolocation, unlike a lot of other animals that can echolocate, they can eavesdrop on another dolphin's echolocation <laughs> to see what they're looking at. If I'm looking at something and I point, another person's going to look and see the thing. That's what dolphins are doing. So if somebody's echolocating, it's like, oh, hey, what are they looking at? What are they listening to? <laughs> I really want that ability now. Um, a few months ago, I was trying to describe to Lauren a pattern that I had seen online that I wanted her to try weaving um, in a band that she was going to make for me. And she tried doing it and something happened. I don't know. Never managed to get it. And then just last night, she passed me a book and said, what do you think of, uh, of this pattern that I'm going to make for so-and-so? And I looked at it and I said... This. This is the pattern I was talking about. <laughs> and she said, oh, I had something totally different in mind. Like, And that happens all the time with Absolutely. people. Where you describe something and what they hear doesn't match up with what you see in your head. Exactly. And so wouldn't it be cool to have exactly what you saw going to yeah. somebody this else? This is what I right? want. Here you go. <laughs> Here's the picture. So cool. Like those Ikea... Um, design your kitchen things. It would be like that. Except yeah, absolutely. <laughs> mind to mind. Absolutely. Dolphins also have signature whistles. So apparently uh, dolphins, I'm not sure if it's every species, but I know a lot of species, uh, when they're quite young, they make up a whistle for themselves and they're unique to each individual. Apparently they're mimicking their mother's whistle, but it always comes out a little bit different. Little bit. And that's how they introduce themselves no. to new dolphins. And if they are known dolphins to each other, other dolphins will call them by that whistle. And they will only use that whistle when that dolphin is there. Nice. So it's very specific. And this is the only known instance of an animal that is not a human having a specific term for a specific individual. Yeah. You know, some other animals will have certain calls or squawks or something that mean predator or something like that, but they mm -hmm. don't mean Bob and they don't mean like <laughs> Julie, right? The way that humans typically have. So that's pretty cool. And then finally, to talk about whales a little bit. Whales, of course, we love whale songs, right? They're so soothing. They go right along with all that crystal stuff, <laughs> right? But... Some whales, particularly orcas, sing in particular dialects, and the dialects will be specific to each pod, each grouping of whales. And they are apparently so specific that if you take an individual whale of unknown origin, and you record their song, and you match it with known pod songs, and you find it, you'll be able to find where they're from, because they are so individual that you can say, oh, this whale's from the North Pacific, <laughs> if you had no idea. I think that's amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of like you can hear an accent and you can be like, Texas. <laughs> you know, or like something like that. When right? it can be Texas, it would be from this particular town in Texas. Yeah. Right, no, Texas. yeah, exactly. So it's even more specific. So that, I think that's really, really cool about them. So their communication, while it's not like ours, of course it's not. They're not structured the same, right? It appears to be very complex, and we really just don't know enough to say, yes, they are complex communicators or not. But just with their echolocation alone, that is really impressive. If that's mm. not intelligence, I don't know what that is. And that's part of the real cruelty of, of things like keeping orcas in captivity, is that they take orcas from totally different pods and they just throw them together and are like, here, you're family now. Right, exactly. <laughs> and their social structure is... 
you know, a lot of creatures do have a social structure. We talked about primates and even a lot of creatures that we wouldn't consider very in- intelligent do seem to live in social structures. But the social behaviors of the whales and dolphins are so important to their life, mm-hmm. right? Um, so with orcas, for example, it's small pods that are headed by a female and her children will stay with her for life. The only time that they'll split off is if they die or um, if the female children have their own children and then the pod just gets too big. So then eventually they will they will split off from there. But male orcas will stay with their mother for life. Um, and there have been instances where the mother has died and there's been three or four males um, that were living with her and they just stayed together because they're a family unit. So that and considering that they have lifespans of 50 years or so, that's a long time. So it's so important to their to their structure. And it's very complex to, like we were talking about, their their social structure often consists of a small, very tightly knit group, somewhere between two and five individuals, depending on the species and that. And then there's usually other orders, you know, so you could think of it as like your immediate family and then you're like your first and second cousins and then maybe like all those other people you're related to. The people you see at Christmas. The people you see at Christmas. Well, that's my first cousins. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God, you've got a big family. <laughs> but, you know, you, you can think of it that way in terms of a, a human social structure, right? And, of course, that immediate family unit or um, in some cases, it's just a few unrelated males, especially in dolphins, will really stick together and they'll just form a bond and they'll stay there. Then they might join with a couple other of those units if there's something going on or if there's a lot of food or if there isn't and they, somebody needs help or something. Or, you know, if there's a couple of big groups um, that are kind of fighting over territory or something, then those secondary groups will join with a third group until it's <laughs> resolved and then they'll disband. So it is really complex that way. It's not just sort of a, hey, I'm just with all the other things here, so I'm just going to follow them. And they'll do things like mourn for their fallen brethren. They do, yeah. They've they've been shown to mourn. And their sticking together is so important that they will do that at times to the peril of the entire group. So there have been instances where... Um, a sick or wounded dolphin has moved off to shallow water and the entire group has gone to shallow water and been beached and had problems there because it's so ingrained in them to stay together and to just to follow and stay there. So it's the social structure is a huge part of their lives there. Not a lot of the objectivist dolphins, I guess. No, not so much. (laughs) Not so much. I guess it just doesn't pay to be an individual (laughs) as a dolphin. (laughs) Gummies. Yeah. So in terms of cognition, because of course, with these big brains and this interesting communication, we looked at, well, what can they actually think about? Because we've done a lot of studies, we've been able to see that they have displayed many facets of learning and intelligence, including learning to manipulate objects. They've been able to learn to recognize symbols as representations of things or events. Um, Social learning, of course. They've also been shown to have the metacognition, so to be able to be aware that they're thinking and to think about their thinking. So I have no idea how they've done this test, but they've done tests where dolphins have been able to display whether they are certain or uncertain about a proposition that was given. Oh, cool. So I have no, again, (laughs) and I'm not going to get into this because it's way too advanced, but isn't that incredible that you can figure that out without being able to actually say like yeah. is yeah. this blue right and the dolphin sure? can indicate that yeah. yeah we'll have links to a lot of this yeah. research in the show notes too they've they and they of course they've passed the mirror test um at first it was unclear if they passed the mirror test because the mirror test again was in uh designed for creatures that had limbs that could wipe their heads um <laughs> yeah. so the mirror test and for if creatures that are primarily visual yes creatures primarily too. visual creatures that can actually attack reach their heads and and manipulate their bodies in that way. So it's not a great test for dolphins, but they have been shown to uh, actually pass it. So the mirror test is basically you put an animal in front of a mirror and you put a dot or something on their head. And if they figure out that the dot is on their head and it belongs to them, then they are aware of themselves. Some animals will do that and will try to get the dot off of them. Other animals will just say, oh, there's a cat with a dot in the thing. Cats are dumb. Love my cats, but they're dumb. <laughs> yeah. My cats don't ever seem to care. Like, look at the kitty. Uh-huh. 
They only <laughs> they only care if there's another cat, and then it's like you're in my territory. Anyway, yeah. So, so the mirror test is like a test of self awareness. Yeah. Uh, whether you recognize that the image in the mirror is you instead of just another animal, so you recognize mm-hmm. that the dot you right. see in the mirror is a dot on your face, not a dot on some other animal. Yeah. Yeah, and apparently, and dolphins have been able to pass that test, and then variations, like they were shown live stream videos of themselves compared to pre-recorded videos of themselves or videos of other dolphins, and they've been able to distinguish if it's them or not, apparently. So that's that's pretty good. Um, some dolphins have actually even used some primitive tools. So there's a group of dolphins off the coast of Australia that will bite off a piece of sea sponge and use it to cover their, their beaks or their, yeah. their bills when they're foraging in the sand to protect their skin so it doesn't get all roughed up when they do that. Cool. Well, and I, I think it was also um, when they wanted to get sea urchins and they didn't want to get stung, they would put the, the sure. sponge on them. Yeah. They don't use a lot of tools, but they have been used. And it's not mm-hmm. all dolphins, too. It's some, depending on their environment and what kind of prey they're looking for. And the interesting thing, too, is that the groups that have learned this, they teach this to their offspring. So once, kind of like the primates, once they learn a new tool, they teach it to their offspring. So they're able to pass that along in the same way. So it's not just opportunity and it's not just instinct. Some other examples of ways that we found that dolphins are very bright and are able to learn and and display intelligence is that we've given them, we've put them through a test where the testers were testing for novel behaviors, but Mm -hmm. the dolphins didn't know this. I mean, you can't tell them that (laughs) they're, do something new and I'll give you a treat, but they would do this test where they would only reward a new behavior. So every day they would only reward a new behavior and the dolphin had to figure it out and it took them some time, um, but then they did figure it out and then apparently the dolphins started doing so many novel behaviors that they didn't know what to throw fish at and what not to, so they had to stop the test. What's really interesting about this though is that they did the same test with humans and it took humans about the same amount of time to figure it out as with dolphins. Mm. So that's pretty cool. That's the opposite of the test where if you push this lever, I'll give you food and see how long it takes them to just keep pushing the lever. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Another great example is that a group of dolphins in captivity were trained to clean their tanks. So to go and find all the refuse at the bottom, bring it up. Every time they brought a piece of whatever up, they got a fish for it, right? So this one dolphin was seen hoarding things under a rock. So then she would bring up a whole bunch at once and get a lot of fish. She would also take one thing and bite it into small pieces and bring up piece (laughs) by piece. So she got a bunch of fish. That's clever. She would, and then apparently too, she would sort of play around and lure some seagulls in and trap a bird and then bring that for more fish. So she's pretty bright (laughs) to figure out that one piece gives me this, but if I make it into many pieces, I get many fish Mm -hmm. that's that's pretty incredible and that's the sort of thing where her particular kind of intelligence comes into play because that will get her more food and more resources yay absolutely absolutely and then finally uh dolphins exhibit spontaneous play we often think of dolphins doing the tricks at sea world and stuff like that but in the wild they do play um they've been observed doing uh games sort of like tag and chasing each other around they'll frequently bite off pieces of seaweed and just play with that kind of like a cat would play with a, a cat toy or something um they'll also they've also been seen blowing bubbles and kind of looking at their bubbles and swimming around and making kind of little vortexes and playing with that and making even bubble rings and that and playing with that and finally they like to play in the waves not just natural waves but when a ship comes by they come up there's ripples that come off the bow and they will play in those in those little waves that are made there so spontaneous play and just enjoying that they do it much the way that humans might So given all of this, a lot of this behavior sounds quite intelligent. There sounds like a lot of learning going on and memory is involved, especially in those social groups and understanding the complex situations and those signature whistles there and remembering the names of thousands of different creatures that you've encountered over time. So cetaceans definitely do seem to have quite a lot of intelligence. Um, One thing that we might think, um, I'm just thinking back to Ashlyn's segment about the primates is, you know, oh, well, they're not big tool users, right? But we also wanna think about what is the context of the animal in the environment? Cetaceans, for example, are the primary predators, right? They don't have a lot of predators. They, and they've typically had an ample food supply. So 
did they need tools? Yeah, they don't right? really have much motivation to develop tool use. Right. If you can easily eat well and be safe without tools, then you probably wouldn't spend your effort on making tools. You know, humans, on the other hand, couldn't really do that without tools, so we really focused on tools. So if we're looking for tools, it doesn't make sense in this context, necessarily. So to answer my question from earlier, yeah, it turns out dolphins are as awesome as I thought they were. <laughs> yes. Okay, Leslie, why don't you tell us uh, about uh, farm animals? Sure. Uh, so I'm going to spoil my own segment here and tell you if you don't want to eat dogs because you think they're too intelligent, you definitely shouldn't be eating pork either. Dog bacon is less delicious. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up on a mixed farm. We had a weanling hog barn in the late 80s and... We were one of the largest hog producers in Manitoba. Depending on how you look at it, our barn was either one of the first evil factory hog barns or one of the last friendly family hog barns. Definitely uh, evil. I know you. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, got out of it basically because there was a dip in hog prices right at the same time where regulations were supposed to be coming in. Uh, although how we were raising our piglets far exceeded the intentions of the new regulations, these regulations were impractical. Uh, documentation was needed for everything and, and the things that we would have had to install would have been really hard for us on a mixed farm. As an example, instead of using a pet type gate that the pigs could just run in, in and out of whenever they wanted to, we could only let them out for a certain time of day and no longer than that and bring them back in after a certain time. and. Uh, we couldn't afford it in time or money, and more than this, we thought it was just silly. And I can kind of see the logic behind a regulation like this, but it was written by somebody who thought that pigs would be too stupid to know when to come in from outside by themselves. And this speaks to why knowing the intelligence or ability of an animal is so important. It's not just to deepen our general pool of knowledge, but it's also to make practical rules and regulations regarding how animals should be treated. So, cows. We raised a lot of cows in my lifetime. We had what I would call smart cows, but they were very few and far between. <laughs> my uh, brother and I had a pet cow we bought off of my grandpa, and her name was Friendly, and she was the smartest cow ever. <laughs> um, but I admit I'm kind of biased here because she was my cow. She was 16 years old when we bought her, and she was about 22 when she died, and oh. I had just as much affection for her as I do any of my other pets. And it's really hard for me looking at how intelligent cows are, because I, I'm so biased towards thinking my friendly is way smarter than most people, never mind <laughs> <laughs> other animals, and it's really hard not to anthropomorphize her. In uh, reading or listening to interviews with scientists, I heard over and over again, even from the ones who are arguing against animals having a higher level of intelligence or empathy or understanding, and I'm paraphrasing here, They'll say animals don't, except for my dog, who is brilliant. <laughs> but I digress. In much the same way, when I'm mopping the floor and I move my beagle's dog dish six inches to the side, she can't figure out where her dish went or if this is still her dog dish or if she <laughs> should, should drink for it. Cattle kind of do the same thing, which you wouldn't think is usually a sign of intelligence, but that's not to say that they can't do intelligent things. Some of the cows can figure it out right away. And are the smart cows showing more intelligence? Or are they just better at interpreting the cues that humans are giving them? Or is knowing how to interpret cues that humans give them a sign of intelligence on its own? Uh, there's many anecdotal examples of cows doing things that we think that cattle shouldn't know how to do. And they range from the extremely common, like, anybody who's ever put up a new fence, there's always a cow that can get out of it and nobody can understand why. <laughs> to the more uncommon things, like when I was typing this out, I was looking over a cattle pasture and there was only two cows in the herd that could figure out how to thaw the water spout when it froze. <laughs> to the really uncommon things, like cows who can figure out how to work water pumps. Now, I've known people who couldn't figure out how to work water pumps too. <laughs> and these people will be the first ones to die in the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> So how, how did the cows thaw the, was it by licking it or? Yeah, they basically just snuggle up to it. If that didn't work, they'd put their whole mouth over it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to explain that motion. <laughs> it helped to be a dolphin right now, I guess. <laughs> they do the toddler at a water fountain. We call that maneuver. 
Yeah. You just whole mouth over it. Oh, whole mouth over it, yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> we don't let her do that. Yeah. Oh, no. She actually, our toddler doesn't understand how to use it. She mostly gets slashed in the face, so it's okay. <laughs> that just really freaks me out. Oh, my God. Well, much like uh, you were talking about with whales, how they will also do things that are detrimental to their health, cows will do the same thing. And I will never understand why when cows are having issues calving, they will go to the steepest, furthest snowbank to have their calves in. (laughs) But I also don't understand why when people are choking, they'll also wander off into a bathroom stall and lock it behind them. (laughs) Just because, you know, people or animals do something that we think is stupid doesn't necessarily mean that they aren't intelligent either. So pigs. Pigs are freaking smart. Pigs are by far the smartest animal I've ever worked with. They're way smarter than chickens, turkeys, pigeons, ducks, whatever. They're way smarter than our cattle and much smarter than our dogs. If you Google the term, how smart is a pig, you'll see tons of headlines pop up that'll say things like, smarter than dogs, as smart as a three-year-old, just as smart or smarter than dolphins or apes. And this illustrates the reason why trying to compare the intelligence in two different animals is pretty much useless. Mm -hmm. A pig is going to be a lot better at doing something on land than a dolphin would be doing something on land, just because pigs have evolved to do what they can do. Sometimes when apes... You'll have three cups with a ball under one. You point to one. Apes will sometimes have trouble figuring out which cup has the ball under it or Mm -hmm, which cup mm -hmm. has the grape under it. Pigs and dogs can figure this out no problem. That's not to say that pigs are smarter than apes. It's just a different task. Uh, Pigs and dogs have grown up knowing how to do this because they've been around us and they know how to interpret human cues. Sure. That makes sense. Another problem that I had, too, is most of the articles that were written were based on one of two studies that were both really, really bad. (laughs) And depending on who was writing the article, the conclusions that they would reach were wildly, wildly different. Still, by all accounts, pigs are pretty intelligent. Uh, They can play the problem-solving or critical thinking games just as good or better than most animals. They've been taught to play video games. They have an incredible... (laughs) Wait, wait, wait. Let's not move fast. They've been taught to play video games? (laughs) Sure. So they designed a special joystick that pigs could operate with their snouts. Right. Okay. So we're talking like Atari 2600 here? Yeah. And Are pigs uh... playing Missile Command? (laughs) I took it to be a... Oh, what was that? Space Invaders kind of game where they just had to <laughs> move their move around yeah, something? further, closer, go around things. I'd love and to see okay. a pig play Crossy Road. <laughs> and yeah, picked it up, no problem. Uh, they have an incredible memory for things that don't work, which is another thing that a lot of people have problems with. Uh, we really notice this all the time. If we had an electric fence up and the pigs would find it they would never cross that line again and it was just amazing because you'd see this pig running full speed down across this field and all of a sudden they turn sharply at this invisible line where a fence used to be five years ago but they'd remember it and they'd teach their piglets not to run across it Hmm. it's interesting uh for problem solving if you want your heart to just melt and i think that we can link to this in our show notes uh there's a video of a pig doing the kind of puzzle that my two-year-old might do, but she's putting different color pig-shaped pieces into a bigger pig-shaped board. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I've seen so that. Cute. There's so many pigs. <laughs> <laughs> and the video looks like a home video, but this thing kind of thing has been replicated in the lab as well. Uh, the reason why home videos are kind of useless is because when doing tests like this, we need to control for everything. Yeah, including, like clever Hans, right? Yeah, including ourselves. And it's so easy when working with animals to attribute qualities to them or talents to them that they don't actually possess. Uh, most people who work with pigs or dogs will be positive that their animals show emotions that people show. Uh, Alexandra Horowitz did a study to determine if dogs who looked guilty actually looked guilty or were just acting submissive. She divided them up into two groups, and although half of the dogs didn't do anything wrong at all, all of the dog owners were told that the dogs had done something wrong, and all of the dogs were scolded. And it didn't matter what if the dog had done something wrong or not, all of the dogs acted guilty. Hmm. All the owners thought that the dogs were acting guilty. Yeah, we're putting a lot of uh, a lot of pressure yeah. on on these animals. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Our, our own biases. Yeah. In interpreting what we see. Yeah. 
Now, I grew up with pigs. I probably spent more time in our pig barn than I did in our living room. And unfortunately, most people get the wrong impression of pigs and as farming as a whole, thanks to the media and certain activist groups pushing their agenda. And whether it's animal rights groups or animal welfare groups, anti-GMO groups, pro-GMO groups, pro-organic groups, anti-organic groups, <laughs> everybody's got their own spin on the stories that they want to tell. So people tend to get the impression that pigs either live in their own filth or are complete sophisticates that drink tea while wearing a monocle and speak with an English <laughs> accent. But pigs are very clean animals and they do suntan and burn like people. So they may roll in the mud to cool, but they're just as capable of, of cleaning themselves off. They potty train themselves much better than my kid will. <laughs> so, so, so there's like an area? Yeah, like a spot. They'll kind of like a cat will. If there's something, oh. they can bury something, they will. Oh, nice. If they can oh. hang their butt out over a ledge or something. <laughs> they like that. Yeah, our pigs would do that. Uh, they're great at figuring out how to feed themselves. And they're very social with other animals. And uh, will actually manipulate their way into sucking off a cow's teeth if they're able to. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but they can also be can also be incredible jerks and bullies. And I couldn't find a lot of studies on hogs. And a few of the ones that I did find hit a paywall. So I had to rely on some summaries and quotes from authors in other publications. But one thing that was consistent is that pigs play with toys, they're social, and they even play fight. Now, again, I love pigs, but I thought it was funny when they say play fight, because they will. They'll play fight, but they will also beat the piss out of each other. <laughs> <laughs> and this is totally absent from the research and articles I read, although, like, it was hinted at a few times. It's my experience that they form groups, and it's the strongest pig in the strongest group that gets to be the top animal in the pen. Though that might not necessarily be the strongest hog in the pen, the third, fourth, and fifth strongest might get together and beat up the strongest, so the third strongest gets to end up to be the top pig. <laughs> this has been kind of recreated in labs, but it's not with them beating each other up. I don't know, maybe there's an ethical problem with letting <laughs> pigs beat each other up. Uh, but just think about the sophisticated social structure that is needed for this to happen. Mm-hmm. Of course, sophisticated social structures may be an indicator of higher intelligence, too. Studies have shown that pigs can be deceitful. To these studies, I say, well, yeah, of course, in much the same way that when my calmer dog is getting sick of my yappier dog, she'll ask to get let out, only to pretend to go out as the other dog whizzes by her, and then she'll go back and lay down and maybe eat the other dog's food. <laughs> Pigs will do kind of the same thing. In one study, a pig would pretend to not know where the food was when a bigger pig was around, only to eat it when the other pig was otherwise occupied. <laughs> the study was done with controls, but the author still couldn't be sure that there weren't other reasons for the pig hiding his actions. Maybe the smaller pig wasn't trying to be deceitful. Maybe she just learned that it hurts when she eats and the bigger pig is around watching her as opposed to she was specifically trying to be deceitful. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to see pigs play dumb all the time. We also used to see pigs hide food and toys from other pigs. That was the next step in the research that they wanted to do. Uh, sometimes when all the pigs were out of the stalls, we would also see a group of them lure one pig who had been beating them up in the past into a situation where the jerk pig herself would get beaten up. Oh, and again, no. think about the intelligence that this takes, <laughs> like you're setting a trap. And relying on the other pigs. Pigs are jerks, man. Pigs are jerks. <laughs> hey, people are jerks. People are also <laughs> jerks. The more you talk, the more I'm like, this sounds like people. <laughs> this sounds like so many people. <laughs> Our pigs were usually kept in pens. And although we did have a few farrowing and uh, gestation stalls, these are the stalls that you put a pig in if you're working on them or if they're about to have piglets, mostly so the sow wouldn't lay on her babies and suffocate them or try to eat them or anything. There's been a big controversy about them lately, and a lot of places they're actually banned. We did have one, we didn't use them a lot, but we did have one sow that could not get along with any of the other pigs. And no matter where we tried to put her, she would just get beaten up all the time. So eventually, she would learn to eat in her pen, then jump the corral, break into her stall, and it's basically where she lived. Now, 
Keep in mind that once she was out of the pen, she could have went anywhere in the barn, under the heat lamp and the chop bin, but she chose to let herself into a stall and shut the gate behind her. There was water there, but we didn't feed her there, so she would have to let herself out and jump back into her pen to eat. And if she happened to be out of the stall and we tried to put another sow in her stall, she would freak right out. <laughs> now think about the intelligence that this shows. Never mind that she's opening a gate that was d designed specifically for pigs not to open. <laughs> she also picked a place where she would be left alone by the other pigs and by us. She seemed to know not to do anything that would get her kicked out of the stall. And she knew enough to let the gate shut, but not let the gate slam behind her, locking her in. So what does this mean for pig intelligence? I have no idea. <laughs> Maybe it seems like I'm painting a negative picture of hogs too, but it's the traits that we see as negative that could prove the intelligence of an animal just as much as traits that we associate with being positive. And I can spend all day telling you stories about cuddling with my pigs and playing with them and dressing them up and <laughs> my pigs... <laughs> My pigs knew me just, just as well as my dogs did, and they got excited when they saw me, and if they saw my dad, they knew they were about to get fed, and just like our, our cats or dogs, when they hear mm -hmm. that crinkling, when they hear the gate open, they know when their food is coming. And speaking of food, pigs are also great at figuring out amounts. My daughter can't add yet, but she can usually figure out if there's four crackers in pile A and six crackers in pile B. She wants pile B. And this may seem simple to us, but not every animal can do this. Can figure out which pile has more. Which pile has more. Yeah. Um, my dogs will see pile A first, and that's the one they want, because <laughs> that's the one that they saw first. Uh, pigs can usually figure out what pile of chop is bigger, and it's a lot harder to figure out how big a pile of chop is versus mm -hmm. specific numbers. It's just a lot more nuanced a skill to develop. And maybe this is just a comment on a pig's social structure, but also pigs sleep in piles like puppies do. And <laughs> it's the cutest thing in the world. <laughs> pigs do seem super cute. And I think I would be much keener on having a, a, a little pig as a pet than I do our two cats. <laughs> Although little pigs tend to become big pigs. And that's yes. actually a big problem in the, in the pig pet market. <laughs> Yes. Well, that's the thing. I'm not keen on having like a 400 pound pig walking <laughs> around in here. You could get one of the little miniature guys. Could a, a little pot bellied piglet, so long as it doesn't get too big. That's just like those house hippos, man. Oh yes. God, a house hippo. <laughs> Still want a house hippo. The crumbs of peanut butter on toast. Yeah. Uh, for, for, for those of you not aware, I think we've mentioned it before, house hippos were part of an advertising campaign in Canada. And, Many years ago. And, and, yeah, every, every child who saw those campaigns took the wrong message from it. Instead of taking the message... Don't believe everything you see on TV. They took the message, I want a house hippo. <laughs> <laughs> it's still on YouTube if you want to look it up. Uh, pigs are also really good with mirrors. They've never passed the dot on the forehead self-awareness test, but they will use mirrors to find out where the food is behind them. They'll know to look behind mirrors in a way a lot of other animals don't. Uh, right now, the debate about animal intelligence seems to be going around in circles in a lot of ways. There's a lot of instances where people will move the goalposts, saying that if thing X happens, it would clearly demonstrate a higher level of intelligence. And then that thing happens, and then they decide, well, no, now, if, if this other thing happens, and I have no idea where the goalposts should be. Um, maybe it sh shouldn't have been moved to start off with. Or maybe we don't even need like a goalpost to, to say whether it's intelligent or not. It's mm -hmm. just there's lots of factors in intelligence. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But I'll leave with uh, my favorite pig quote by biologist Tina Wadowski, who studies pigs. And she said, when I was working with monkeys, I used to look at them and say, if you were a pig, you would have had this figured out by now. <laughs> <laughs> So the last group of animals that we're going to talk about are birds. So don't be fooled by the fact that their heads are the size of ping pong balls. Uh, birds can be amazingly intelligent. Uh, corvidae, or corvids, is a family that contains crows, ravens, rooks, and magpies. And it's typically held up as a paragon of non-human intelligence. There seems to be consensus among researchers that corvids are the most intelligent of the birds, and some argue that they're more intelligent than many non-human primates. Mm -hmm. 
their total brain to body mass ratio, which we were discussing earlier with the cetaceans and the primates, is uh, equal to that of the great apes and the cetaceans, uh, approximately, uh, varying from species to species in the group. And it's only slightly lower than the brain to body mass ratio in humans. Causal reasoning has also been observed in rooks and New Caledonian crows, where they can uh, infer cause and effect from disparate events. And the Eurasian magpie, for example, is the only non-mammal species known to be able to recognize itself in the mirror test. Hmm. So the only other species that have been able to do that are mammals, but the Eurasian magpie can do it. I always thought of magpies as super dumb. Magpies are super (laughs) smart, but they're also jerks. Oh yeah, they're they're terrible (laughs) jerks. They're just the jerkiest. Yeah. Yeah. Crows and rooks have also been observed making and using tools. Mm -hmm. Uh, Until recently, both of these traits were thought to be observed in primates alone. Mark Beckoff, a former professor of ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Colorado, has argued that magpies are also capable of feeling complex emotions, including grief. They have been observed taking part in grieving rituals for dead kin, and uh, some of these rituals include laying grass wreaths near the deceased. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, In addition to controlled observations, corvid intelligence is also well attested outside of the lab. So you want an example of tool use? (laughs) This is arguably one of the cooler examples of tool use. Uh, A carrion crow was observed cracking nuts by placing them on the road at a crosswalk where they were cracked by passing cars, then waiting for the light to turn red before safely entering into the roadway to retrieve the contents. (laughs) Use what's in your environment. Yeah. Absolutely. That's just a, a brief look at intelligence and birds, but they are, uh, it's its pretty amazing. And especially when you consider how long-lived some of these birds are, when you look at parrots, for example, they can learn a lot throughout their lifetime. When the, it was a crow was the first one that was observed making its own tool too, wasn't it? Yeah. Just like curving the wire or whatever to fish things out of mm-hmm. various places. And My favorite thing about Corvid intelligence is watching them solve multi-step problems. Uh, so there's a oh, lot yeah. of like YouTube videos where you can go and watch them solve these problems that are like four or five or 12 steps long that they have to work out. And I couldn't figure out these puzzles. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always, I just just always blown away when I can watch these things. So it's one of the only YouTube videos I will actually voluntarily click on. (laughs) (laughs) I'm a sucker with animals with YouTube videos. (laughs) Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll throw some of those in the show notes too. (laughs) So cognition in non-human animals is a fascinating field of study. And we only scratched the surface here tonight. We didn't talk much about octopodes, which uh, exhibit a number of higher level skills, including tool use. Uh, We didn't talk too much about household pets and how trainability can correlate to intelligence. Uh, We managed to get through the whole show barely mentioning animal rights at all. (laughs) But uh, I wanted to, uh, to top things off with a couple of book recommendations. I think Last Chance to See is uh, one of my favorite books written by Douglas Adams, and I think it's his only nonfiction book. He wrote it with Mark Carradine, uh, who's a wildlife photographer and naturalist, uh, and I think that it's Douglas Adams' best book. Uh, Last Chance to See, it's uh, where they where he travels around the world with Mark Carradine uh, looking for animals that are in danger of extinction. And it's just uh, wonderfully written, it's funny, it's touching, and it talks a, a lot about different groups of animals in uh, just a really, a really kind of humanizing way. And uh, I highly recommend it. Uh, and there's also a follow-up BBC series that Mark Carradine did with Douglas Adams' friend Stephen Fry, actually, just a few years ago, also called Last Chance to See, which you can look up. And also David Brin's Uplift series, if you're interested in sort of a science fiction take on animal intelligence, uh, the conceit is that humans uh, in the near future genetically engineer different animals, including uh, chimpanzees, gorillas, uh, and dolphins, to enhance their intelligence and their ability to communicate with humans. And so you get wildly different perspectives, and it's like a science fiction story, and it's, it's really neat. 
You may have noticed uh, changes in sound quality for this episode, and you can expect things to fluctuate a little bit over the next few months. That's because we're in the process of acquiring our own permanent equipment to produce this show. Uh, we've been renting equipment for a little while, uh, but before we go, we'd like to extend a warm thank you to friend of the show, Ryan Gerber, whose generous donation went a long way to helping us secure new equipment of our own. So thank you, thank you, thank you, and thanks to everybody who donates to support the show. You can go to LUEPodcast.com wordpress.com and click on the donate link if you'd like uh, and if you don't like that's fine too if you liked this episode please let us know the best way to do that is by leaving us a glowing review on itunes uh, or on stitcher uh, where we also appear uh, the second best way to do this is to find us on facebook or twitter at luee podcast i think that'll do it for us this month we'll be back next month to talk about mental health but for now so long and thanks for all the fish You've been listening to Life, the Universe, and Everything Else. If you have any questions or comments, or you'd like to suggest a topic for the show, send us an email at lueepodcast at winnipegskeptics.com. If you want to show your support, give us a review on iTunes or Stitcher, follow us on Twitter or Facebook, or just share the show with a friend. Our music is produced by the very talented Ian James, and this episode was edited by Jem Newman. Everybody be prepared to dumb everything down. <laughs> You're listening to Life, the Universe, and Everything Else. Today on the show, we're talking about intelligence in non-human animals. Because I don't actually know how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> That's what the music is, the chicken, chicken dance? dance. My name is Jem Newman, and with me today I have Leslie Saunders. Hello. I should introduce this in a different order because you're like our special guest. I'm yes. sorry, I'm going to do you last. <laughs> special in like, what, an eating paste kind of way? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so, Laura, okay. give us an example. Of what? I love cats. Oh, cats are terrible. I love cats. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I would like to point out that Laura actually was talking before Jem cut her off to say you need to talk. <laughs> Jim, you're a jerk. <laughs> and this cat, I will fall asleep. The cat will be sitting on top of me. I will wake up. The cat will still be sitting on top of me. But then I uh, go to get out of bed and there's like six dead mice. Oh, God. <laughs> so I have no idea what that cat's doing if all these mice are in our house. Well, they're, they're dead. That's what the cat's doing. <laughs> I remember one night I was, this is before I moved into this house, I was up playing like Baldur's Gate one night or whatever, and uh, I heard a weird noise and I peeked over the corner of my computer monitor and saw our two cats tossing a mouse back and forth between them in the air, just like playing with it, moving it back and forth in their teeth, and they, they would toss it to the other and the other one would bat at it and then toss it up in the air. And this went on for about three minutes. And then I saw one of them just toss it extra high and it sailed through the air and landed right in one of my boots. And they kind of looked at the boot, lost interest, and walked away. <laughs> I'm glad you were watching. <laughs> yeah, I was like, holy shit, I'm glad I saw that. <laughs> it would have been an unpleasant surprise in the morning. <laughs> I'm wearing a really padded bra, but I am still lactating, so if I get up... <laughs> <laughs> That's the best outtake just, ever. Just probably <laughs> not what... No one cares. <laughs> <laughs> it happens, okay? I don't want to talk all of my talking all at once. You Aren't do? I sophisticated? I don't want to talk all of my talking all at once. I thought I did really good, and then Laura's was like three times as long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm proud. I think that uh, I'm not the one who's droning on endlessly this episode. Oh, no, 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 it's a good thing. It's a good thing. I like not being that person. It's so yeah, rare. Except yeah, but you just said she was droning on endlessly. Okay, well maybe it's just me, but I consider droning on endlessly to be an advantage. It's not a criticism. No, Jem, it's a criticism. Studies have shown that pigs can be deceitful. Do pigs say, uh, Mommy said I could watch Frozen. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's my experience with deceitful animals. Anyone else have any book suggestions? 
Unless you want some pop-up books. (laughs) (laughs) So long, and thanks for all the fish. Four. Four Douglas Adams quotes. Maybe three? (laughs) Four? I had had another clip that I was going to play, but I cut it out. Oh, gotcha. (laughs) You can always insert it in post. Yeah. He will. Oh, he will. (laughs) It is possible that Trillian's observation would have commanded greater attention had it been generally realized that human beings were only the third most intelligent life form on the planet Earth, instead of, as was generally thought by most independent observers, the second. They, they, they assume that the beard serves a purpose. The beard is a purpose in and, and of itself. itself. Yeah. I don't know why that would be funny. Sorry.